Hey folks, welcome back to Ken Michaels Radio, where we talk about the Beatles on all of our shows here. And a big thank you to all the people who watch this channel, old and new. And if you can, please subscribe. I'd really appreciate it if you could. And um, my special guest uh, this time out is Bob Koenig. Bob and I have been friends now for over 40 years. Uh, you might know that, because um, I mentioned this on many of my podcast shows, that I live in Connecticut, but most of my life I lived on Long Island. And I met Bob in the early 80s. We both worked for the same record store chain called Record World. I sure miss the days of record stores. And um, in addition to that, I know uh, Bob for being a musician, being in several bands. Um, and we'll talk about that in, in a few moments. And um, he has written an article, which is in the latest issue of this magazine here called Retro Fan. And it's all about, well, it's called Beatles Ploitation, which is all about the exploitation of the Beatles and records that came out in the year 1964 in the United States to, pardon the pun, capitalize on the extreme popularity of the Beatles being the biggest band in the country and the world during that year. And so we welcome Bob Koenig to the channel. Hey, Bob. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. It's, it's quite a pleasure and an honor to be here. And uh, as you mentioned, we've known each other for a long time, but never exactly in this facility. So it's a it's a nice new new way of doing things. If you'd have told <laughs> me 40 years ago that we'd be doing this on camera and it would go out right, to the world. right. It's like I said, it's just like the Jetsons. <laughs> it really is. It is. It is. They would show that. Absolutely. They were way ahead of their time on that show. <laughs> but um, before we talk about this article, just want to mention, mm -hmm. since I I, I um, brought up the fact that you've been a musician most of your life, you were in a band called The Keys. You put right. out this album. Right. How far back does this date? Um, some of the tracks on that date back to as early as 1984. Mm -hmm. And um, that was compiled a couple of years ago in 2019. It came out on Zero Hour Records in Australia. And yes, it's still available. I'll have to send you a link to the, the website. Yeah. So you, you actually, from what I understand, don't you have some kind of following in Australia that that prompted this to be released there? Oh, uh, there was that. Well, because Zero Hour puts out a lot of material on Power Pop. Okay. That's how they came upon us. Actually, <laughs> long story short, there, there was another band called The Keys from uh, England. They put out one album in 81. Well, I didn't know anything about it at the time. Uh -huh. uh, but that, that's, a, that's a whole nother story. But uh, yeah, the... The people at Zero Hour were kind enough to make a whole compilation, pass it around. And uh, yeah, a lot of people picked it up. I had uh, an interview with a, a, a magazine in Australia also. It's Psychedelic Baby, it's called. Uh -huh. <laughs> so that, that's that's online also. I don't, I'm don't. i not sure if there was a printed copy, but I know it's definitely online. And uh, and that was, that was good to give a, a brief overview of everything. Uh, and I've done other stuff solo as well. I'm also a uh, recording artist with the uh, Chrome Orange Music. Uh, they work also here out of Long Island. Uh, yeah, that's that <laughs> was from Cat's Paw Records. That was in the that was in the nineties. That one came out. Bros and Icons. That's the one that has uh, me doing "Give Me Love, Give Me Peace on Earth" on it. That's right. I have this one too. That's even mentioned as one of the, ah, uh, yes, look at that. It looks. <laughs> uh, would you believe some people bought that from me because they like the Abbey Road uh, cover of it, but that is me crossing Abbey Lane. That is an actual street in Levittown, uh, Long Island. So uh, it, it was just perfect to add as, as a title to that. Uh -huh. Yeah, and I also remember going back to when I first started doing my Beatles show live on the air that you did a cover of I See Ma Sen that I played. John Lennon song. Was it was it that or I I did do a couple of songs from, um, Mind Games. I happen to really like Mind Games, and I kind of was like doing my own solo promotion of it. Um, I played for 
three uh, Lennon birthday celebration concerts at mm -hmm. um, Five Towns College. And I did Intuition, um, Bring on the Lucy. Very nice. And You Are Here. I, I know I've done, done a couple others from some other things, but yeah, th those were three songs that I did live. Yeah, I just seem to recall playing I Seem to Send on one of my shows. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm glad you love that album because that's my favorite Lennon album. Is it? Still. Really, it's it's one that doesn't get the acknowledgement, I think, that it deserves, whereas Plastic Auto Band and Imagine always does. And Mind right. Games and to a lesser, uh, lesser degree, Walls and Bridges, they kind of get lost in the shuffle. Even well, Walls you... and Bridges, Walls yeah. and Bridges. I remember the first time I heard "Whatever Gets You Through the Night." The radio station mentioned it was Elton John with John Lennon. <laughs> so I was looking for the like Rocket Records forty five, but instead it's on Apple. <laughs> That's another story. That's funny, but I'm glad to see anybody appreciating Mind Games. And and in the various podcast shows that I do, there are some people that look at Mind Games as their favorite album, maybe because. You know, it's kind of fresh to them because those songs aren't played the way that the Imagine album was in particular. I mean, I love it all. Don't Even get me Mind wrong. Games, it's such a great song. It's got that, Definitely. that reggae beat in the middle. and oh. Very unique, I think, uh, as a record. And I love the sound of it, too. But anyway, let's get back to the main reason why you're here. Back to 64. Is, yeah. Um, this article, which Bring I said is in... My Beatles to be. <laughs> <laughs> Retro fan, I mentioned this is the the magazine that it's from. Tell me a little bit about this magazine. Right, it's Beatles Ploitation. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, this is uh, a magazine put out by Two Morrows Company, T W O M O R R O W S, because the uh, editor is John Morrow. Uh, they put out several magazines and articles on different things. Uh, their their biggest focus is a lot on comic books. Hmm. But they also tend to go into something about music or just about pop culture at the at the time when they and us were kids, which would be, I guess, late 50s, early 60s into the 70s. And that's where that's where this is, is perfect. It's fun to have the Wonder Twins on the cover because I watch them all the time <laughs> on TV with the Super Friends. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a perfect issue to, to come out and the editor of uh, retro fan is michael yuri e-u-r-y and uh yeah he, he loved the article and i hope to have uh future articles in the magazine at some point we've already discussed that it might not be beatles but it might be something else to to be in there but uh i have his uh, uh his email also to get in touch with him if you mm -hmm. want to have it later. So this is your first article for the magazine? Yeah, this is my first article. Okay. And I'm glad they, they liked the idea. And the, the whole overall idea of, of the article, I first wanted to have, uh, I, I thought of something that wasn't really in the limelight uh, or anybody seems to talk about is the obscure, weird, unauthorized albums that were coming out and i don't necessarily mean bootleg because there's a tons of those i could talk mm. about those for hours too but but these are not them these are things you would find uh at your five and ten and uh your supermarkets your drug stores these records got uh put out uh everywhere but they weren't necessarily uh an authorized thing or they just had come out so fast that people weren't watching this stuff. And uh, I thought about not only talking about them, but just showing that overall, the year 1964, there was so many records put out. And I'm not even thinking of like, there was a lot of tribute singles like Ringo, I Love You, Ringo right. for President. Yep. There's all that stuff. I don't even go into that. And then, of course, there was a uh, wealth of singles that were out by all the record companies, including uh, Swan, which she loves you, although Swan never actually put out. Well, they had a couple albums that were kind of a tribute, but they they never had anything fully as an album on the Beatles. It was just the She Loves You single. Right. But uh, 
you could see how the public could be confused, easily confused by everything that came out from January 1964 all the way to uh, December of 65. <laughs> Let me ask you, because you and I are pretty close to the same age here. When this was all happening, were you, even as a little kid, looking for records like this, or did you just discover about it later? Uh, yes and no. I discovered about it later, but I can show that my very first record on the Beatles, into the foray of all this stuff, was the <laughs> Chipmunk Sing the Beatles album. And this is actually my real original copy. I didn't get, I, I mean, I saw the Beatles cartoons, um, my my mom had some sheet music where she was playing piano on Beatles songs, but uh, she really couldn't get the whole beat of it. And that's a good crux on these records later that we'll discuss. Mm -hmm. um, I saw Yellow Submarine at the Calderon Theater in Hempstead when it came out. And uh, even my, uh, my first grade teacher and I drew this big, huge cardboard uh, well, oak tag, I think, of uh, the Yellow Submarine, which he used in a in a play at the school where me and three other boys sang Yellow Submarine holding it. And <laughs> do I have any pictures from it to prove it and say it? No, I don't have a thing of it, unfortunately. Well, you show your loyalty to the Beatles in so many other ways. And, um, you know, the four of them have certainly uh, profited from you. <laughs> and many of the people who watch this channel and the people that I do my podcast shows with. But um, anyway, yeah. So just we're, we're making a distinction here, as you just did, because I wanted to bring up the fact that, yes, certainly in 64 and later on, there were a lot of novelty records that came out on the Beatles all the time. And fortunately, there have been some compilations that have come out through the years. And nowadays, sure. you can look up a lot of that stuff on YouTube. So um, and it's fun to listen to those, too. But these were all albums for the most part where the album covers were designed in some ways to resemble a Beatles album or have uh, four right. laptops tops, four wigs right. or whatever. Right. So it was really trying to cash in on the whole Beatles craze. So you have a whole bunch of them there at your disposal and the albums to talk about. And uh, these are all covered in your article in RetroFan. So why don't right. we just show some of the folks what they are? Actually, we could sure. also talk about 1964 in general, all the success that the Beatles had on the charts with the legitimate stuff that came out, obviously on Capitol Records, VJ Records, and they certainly crossed the line with exploitation. Right, right. Well, I thought in order to understand where these certain records came from, you kind of have to see what the major labels were doing because mm. in their own way, they were crossing the line as much as these uh, other companies were. Um, in in England, it was very different. You had the 14 track albums coming out. And of course, certain songs were meant to be singles. So they came out as 45s only initially. Mm -hmm. Whereas in, a, in America, the albums were all toyed around with as far as the tracking goes. And a lot of them, they still included the the hit song besides. So it wasn't just that you bought it as a 45. Now you got it again on, on the album. And some of it gets uh, really confusing. So I thought of a brief overview of some of the, the record covers would then explain some of the ones that happened later. And I can show the other ones, too, in, in between, too. Is okay. that all right to do? That's fine. <laughs> but... um. Do you want to start with, um, say, the budget bin Beatles stuff, or do you want to start with uh, VJ? I, I, VJ is is yeah. a fascinating record well, company. Well, VJ, as we know, by ten days different, VJ rushed this album out, the introducing mm. the Beatles. Uh, I think more people have a fake copy of this than the real one. Mm. <laughs> but uh, this one, a rather plain stoic cover a nice picture of, of the boy smiling but surely not in the state of a, a fandom uh type of thing right and and the back cover is rather plain this is the the second one 
Mm -hmm. This is the one with please, please me and ask me why on it. Whereas like, love me do. And P.S. I love you. Yeah, they were taken off of it. Right. So, of course, this was the the big daddy that started it all in, in America. So then when Capitol finally relented and said, hey, we're going to put out Beatle uh, albums. Of course, they, they the granddaddy of them all was Meet the Beatles. Mm -hmm. And the, the funny thing about this, even uh, this has the song that's already on introducing the Beatles as well. The cover also says the first album by England's phenomenal pop combo. Right. So this is hawking this already as the first, but the other one just came out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the back cover also has an early picture of the Beatles, but it's uh, it's very busy. It reads like a press kit. Yep. I don't even know if uh, the young kids sat there and spent their time reading this, but this was more like, you know, brace yourselves and look for this we are we are the company right it, it it wasn't long after that that they quickly put out an album called the beatles second album mm -hmm. so what's funny is wait a minute wouldn't this be the third one if i was if i was let's say bob in 1964 and parents brought home the records would be like wait a minute i already have two how is this the second one you know so uh right there it gets confusing also, the fact that this album has She Loves You on it, it's on Capitol instead of Swan, mm -hmm. as we talked about with, with, with the single. Yeah. I think some fans might have been able to make the distinction that introducing the Beatles was a different label. So by saying that Meet the Beatles was their first album, it really means the first album on Capitol. Right. But at the same time, you had your famous labels like Adco putting out they they grabbed as fast as possible. This mm -hmm. this came out early. This was like February or or March already of '64. This came right. out, and it's just you know a couple of songs from the Tony Sheridan tracks, and the rest is by another band. Oh, the, the Swallows. With, yeah, the Swallows, and the same with <laughs> MGM putting out something like like this. Right, and they put out 45s too from from this stuff, and. Uh, I, I just think that the, that's part of the exploitation, too, is that they grabbed whatever they could, and it's got, with Tony Sheridan and guests and little writing, but right. if somebody saw this, they thought they were getting an, an authentic uh, thing. Well, if, uh, you were part of, if you were part of the record company, those record companies, wouldn't you want to do the same thing? True, true. And then you have, uh, at the time, now we consider a hard day's night part of Capitol Records or EMI or, or what have you, uh, we have the British configuration. But in America, with soundtracks, and soundtracks were very popular then, soundtracks were bought by adults. In fact, most albums back then were bought by adults. Mm -hmm. uh, you had the United Artists version of A Hard Day's Night, which, as we'll see later, this set the tone for a lot of album covers to promote the, uh, the mop tops. Mm -hmm. <laughs> which funny enough uh they went a as far as to have a, a a label that would take the idea of this and put out this instrumental album with a mop top and it has uh -huh. ringo's theme and and i love her on it <laughs> and this is by al goodman and his orchestra it's from diplomat records which put out a lot of this stuff yeah, that's something that I want to talk to you more about because so that label, see, that label seemed to put out the most of the these most. kind of these kind of albums. So VJ, who was having trouble actually having anything put out uh, anymore, they lost their license, so they put out whatever they possibly could in a rush. And how would people get? You know, people would get confused. They would get this. Jolly Watt, the Beatles, and Frank Ifield, and this is on stage. Well, it's not live, and I'm not sure. I think it's possible at one point they did play with Frank Ifield somewhere, but it it sure wasn't. Uh, it sure wasn't with this. This is all uh, real re recordings and stuff. Right. Actually, funny enough, uh, Frank Ifield did "I Remember You," which is from uh, we have that on the uh, from the uh, the Hamburg, right? The uh, 
yes uh, star club mm -hmm. star club tapes of, of the beatles doing it hmm. but then they went as far as they are uh, vj already had the four seasons so let's make the beatles versus the four seasons and uh try to have a, a showdown between the two groups and have a scorecard on the back which uh which group you actually like better would you happen to know bob if that record today is worth a lot of money it is especially if you find a stereo copy and if it has the poster mine is mono and it doesn't have the poster okay but i'm still happy to have it my favorite of the vj albums and i think this is the one of the best covers because it really was directed to the teen girls was songs pictures and stories of the beatles mm -hmm. this front cover was so great because it opens halfway and that too has biographies and and little pictures so in a way it's even more colorful and interesting than than meet the beatles was right but on the back you get a picture of all four Beatles with the heart underneath where you cut out your picture and you put yourself underneath with your favorite Beatle. And then it says, and for you fellows, tough luck. <laughs> <laughs> it's clever. They put some thought behind that. But it's really something that VJ really went as far as you can go with one album's worth of material one and album's nothing more. And the album there with Frank Ifield only has four Beatle cuts on them. Right, right. The rest are all Frank I feel. And they went out as far as having an interview album. And they also later did their own fake record where it says the Beatles in big print. It's got at least three of the Beatles on the front cover. But this is all by some other group that they decided to hawk at the, at the time. The Mersey Boys, as it yes. says right there. You know, part of me thinks, didn't Capital want to sue a lot of these record companies but they would have so many lawsuits there was so I mean, many things and and in just that think case about it, even in even in memorabilia this this for example i just wanted to show this uh, isn't real it's not a seal tab or whatever they call the the uh, epstein's company for stuff this is fake uh -huh. it's a fake uh beetle item but many uh, a memorabilia item like that came out at the time yeah and, and the then with uh, capital, I showed you the Hard Day's Night album, right? Mm -hmm. Now you got something new. It's not the Beatles' third album. Now it's something new. But wait a minute. Most of the stuff I have on the other album, now it says it's something new. <laughs> something new for capital. It's something new for capital. Mm. But uh, it's it's crazy. Then you look on the back cover, it's got the other albums that you should buy. Mm -hmm. It also shows uh, the Beatles by the Holly Ridge strings. Right. So Capital was, wasn't was stupid. They were going to promote their own little instrumental type of a record. So the, the good people at Somerset also decided to make a similar type of album. And other than the, the color, the album looks incredibly similar to that one. Uh-huh. You know, you 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 were talking about the differences between American albums and British albums, and it just goes to show it was a whole different philosophy and mentality on how they did things, how the British wanted their singles to be separate. They didn't want to right. duplicate it on the albums, and that way they would think that they're cheating their fans. They'd have to buy the records twice, whereas here in America, they felt that you got to give the fans a reason to buy the record, and if you have a hit record on the album, that's more of an incentive to buy it. Right, right. And, oh, and, uh, and us Americans love product. That's why we buy the Beatles story also, which was two records. They could have fit them both on onto one, but instead they made it a big, a big full full album. It's, eh, it's kind of not really needed. Say what you will, Bob, but that album went to number seven on the Amazing. album charts here. Amazing. Such was the power of the Beatles and their popularity then. But um, yeah, of and course, you... This yeah. was in December of 64. We're already starting the marketing of 65. But right. that, that's where we're, we're, we're ending with that. But it's just to show you that alone between VJ, Capital, those other couple of records, uh, there was some 
unusual things out. There also were labels that were kind of dubious in how they would put out stuff. This came out actually early 65, so it's not 64. That's why I didn't mm -hmm. promote it. But there was this, the Savage Young Beatles. Right. So that that was an unusual. The other thing that came out was technically the first pirate or bootleg record was this, the original Greatest Hits. I actually bought this brand new, still sealed in the early 70s. I found it at a store. And uh, this actually contains the alternate Love Me Do, which at that point I never heard before. So when I played it, I was like, whoa, this doesn't sound like the one I know. But so that's, it, this is real Beatle music on here. So that's the one with, is that the one with Dwight Cullen? Yeah, it doesn't say a word, but it is the other version of Love Me Do on there. Okay. Just to make sure, that's the one that Ringo drums on. Right. The British thing. Right. Okay. Right. So that was really something that that record company, what was the name of that company? They actually had the gall to it do that. It was just called Greatest use... Records. And yes, that was the company. The uh, Capitol did get that record uh, taken off the market. So that one they worked on. I guess huh. they figured, well, since it was really the authentic music, they could do that. Okay. Since you mentioned it briefly, as long as you brought up the Beatles story, the VJ album that was all interviews, it's called Hear the Beatles Tell All, that didn't even chart. Didn't even make uh, the album charts here in the United States. Wow. So, And this supposedly VJ or somebody from VJ got the rights to this. They actually put out like a picture disc record of this in the in the late 70s or 80s, I believe. Okay. I know this had been reissued. Uh, one of the worst examples, I say, uh, of the actual authentic albums was how did somebody get, how did Santo and Johnny and their company get away with doing this? Uh -huh. It says the Beatles' greatest hits all over the place. Yeah, it says Santo and Johnny at the bottom. Yep. But then you turn the cover over, there's there's the Beatles with, with them, like... Huh? <laughs> uh, imagine if if I put out, you know, Bob Koenig sings uh, "You Too," and uh -huh. I put their pictures on the back. You know, that wouldn't last too long. <laughs> yeah, I'm really surprised. But like you said, there was so much of this stuff coming out at once. You couldn't sue everybody. When you're using the actual photos of the Beatles, I mean, that's right. really going too far. Well, budget labels like these were. This is from uh, Tower Records, which was a budget label of uh, Capital. So I guess that's how they got to use the Beatle pictures on it. But some people thought this might be worthwhile because it's the Beatles instrumentals. And no, they don't play on this. It has nothing to do with them. Uh -huh. The same with London put out one, the Sing and Play Along Beatles kit. <laughs> you got your family, you get your instruments, and your Beatle wigs and this record and boom, you're the Beatles. <laughs> <laughs> so just e explain to me because i was asking you the question before how did you find these records in the first place because i'm sure at that time you didn't really know quite where to look you might have gotten a few of them but how did you hunt down these records in the first place uh some of them are very easy to find in especially garage sales or thrift stores because it proves that a lot of these things sold uh, one of the best examples and i would say probably the best selling of any of these uh alternate beetle albums was this one the mm -hmm. beetle beat by the bugs the this one had to sell a lot because i've seen so many copies of this it talks about how this was recorded in England and that it's it's official and it's authentic and this and that. Uh, turns out this this group was actually the Coachman Five, and uh, reportedly Gary Wright. So there's a Beatle connection. Gary Wright supposedly plays on this. Yes. Wow. Or he had Spooky Tooth or anything else that he plays on this record. The company acquired the tapes and put out the record as, as the bugs and and some of the the titles of the songs don't even correspond they they do a cover of uh the hollies and doris troy just one look but it's not listed as that i think i think was it mercy mercy is is the is the title but they they just changed the titles of the things for this yeah but 
figure to look, this looks like the Meet the Beatles cover, right? With the with the four of them shaded and, and on the front. Mm -hmm. And you could see how people could mistakenly pick this up as the real thing. Right. There's only two Beatles songs that the group does on there. That the group does, yes. Yeah. Now, uh, let, let me ask you this. I would sure. think that since most of these record companies are small record companies, they couldn't have pressed too many copies. They wouldn't have had it in their budget. So wouldn't these be fairly rare? You would think so. I mean, a lot of copies that I have found, I, I've tried to get uh, some mint ones as best as I could. In fact, the next one I was going to show on Wine Coat, uh, mm. this one actually has a, a price sticker still on it. <laughs> but most of the time you find them, they're pretty well banged up and beat up. So, uh, uh, again, even with these, the Beatlemania in the USA by the Liverpools, but there's the there's the mops again. Mm -hmm. This was an, an obvious uh, uh, standard to go by in these things for ages. Here's our buddies at Diplomat with the Manchesters. And, oh, boy, did they put out a lot of different albums. But the this one's with the, the, uh, the hair. This one, they decided to throw an artwork piece of four boys in beetle hair. And this uh -huh. is also the the, uh, the Manchesters. Now, and then they basically compiled the two, put back out the beetle wigs again, and, and added their version of A Hard Day's Night on, onto, the, uh, onto the record. Bob, do you have any information about Diplomat Records since they put out so much stuff? in this in this vein yeah I, I i tried to get in touch with them uh at one point they're in new jersey uh actually now i th I think are they still going by peter pan records they put out a lot of kitty records oh, okay so uh peter pan diplomat there's a couple of things there was a couple of uh christmas albums if you went to like <laughs> i'm thinking of going to harrow's remember harrow's uh, with the yes. pools and stuff they would always have holiday stuff out and of course they were hawking all those uh christmas compilations and uh a couple of the ones on diplomat uh like there was a santa one there was one with um uh snoopy and the red barrett so they had things like, like that so there, there, there was a, a, a lot of things like that yeah Dip diplomat was was very popular in that that they even put out uh stuff by um uh they had soundtracks uh there's another soundtrack of the south pacific back then it was a big thing for uh soundtrack albums to sell so oh, a sure. lot of that a lot of that went went out um other than that a lot of the covers would come out like pushing the the uh, Long titles. titles of the songs as much as they could and then here in the little small print it's sung by the the weasels <laughs> not even that it's on mercury wing that's like a budget label but mercury was a known label uh-huh you would think somebody would would realize what that was another example with the big lettering of the songs and the uh the mop tops it doesn't really give you it gives you kind of a, a confusing eye when when you first see it and and I think that's that's part of the thing with with, with these albums. Um, a, a, a lot of them came out, and I think or I believe that the parents bought them. You see, kids bought forty fives. Their um, their allowance, their budget, and what they listened to on AM radio was the forty five. Mm -hmm. And a lot of companies, that's what they. They pushed first. They didn't really push an album. An album was something to get, oh, here's a nice picture of uh, Ricky Nelson, and here's a few more songs of his. But you really know him by this song, and it's on the 45s. Uh, so I see a lot of these albums being pushed more to the adults than the kids. Okay, I would think, especially by late 64, the kids would have, would have gotten the idea and and known better like yeah, but because of groups like the beatles where their album sales went through the roof 
here right. from Meet the Beatles or even introducing the Beatles on, you would think that uh, the market would be just perfect for more albums. Sure. Have Beatles material. So, and like you said, if you, if you study the charts prior to the Beatles and even still during the Beatles era, soundtrack albums were massive. Were massive. You know, yes. And um, you look at the charts at, at during those years and you'd be surprised how many soundtrack albums were either number uh -huh. one, you know, a West Side Story or The Sound of Music or those kind of albums, Mary Poppins, they were all number one. So, you know, there there was definitely a market for that, for albums, but maybe they were an older demographic buying them for the kids. Right, possibly, right. But still, but still Beatles you have albums. something like this. Here's the four lads on there, and it says, do the Beatle with double E's as the Beatle. Yeah. Uh, I like showing this album because this one, when I found it in, in a uh, used bin, it had uh, beetle pictures, real beetle pictures taped to the cover on the front and the back. And the back doesn't really show anything but an ad for this record label. Hmm. But uh, on, on this one too, other than doing the, the one song, everything else is more like surf instrumentals. So it really had nothing to do with, with the Beatles. And what I see is a father or a mother saw this Saw the song, I Want to Hold Your Hand. Oh, you know, Sally wanted that song on a 45. This album's going only going for a dollar. She'll get that song, plus she'll get all these others. It all talks about Beatles. It must be what she wants. Uh -huh. And then it was, but mommy or daddy, this isn't this isn't the Beatles. That's not Ringo. Who is this? I don't uh -huh. know who they are. Right. You know, and then it was, well, you got it. That's That's your copy now. And I guess in order for themselves to even feel good about having the record, they smothered it in in Beatle pictures. But Do you know if any of, of these if any of these albums were actually sold in record stores, or were they strictly for like you said supermarkets, pharmacies, right? That kind of right. Thing? Yeah, at, at the time, you know, it seemed uh, besides the official record stores. Uh, I would love to see the Beatles sales on things just from Woolworths. Well, and Woolworths always had budget bins. Mm. I, I remember going through budget bins at Woolworths in the early seventies. I mean, that was, that was a big deal to look and, and find some things. Right. Um, and uh, yes, drug stores and uh, supermarkets did carry a lot of that stuff. So it, it, it was a way of, of getting some things out there, but now let me show you a couple of, of album covers, which are really bizarre. <laughs> this one is the Beagle and the four Liverpool Wigs, W-H-I-G-S. Right. Trying to be cool, which, again, this record is a lot of uh, surfing type of instrumental stuff and also as a guy sounds more Motown singing a couple of songs but they only do they only do the one Beatles song and it's it's horrible it sounds like and I don't mean this insulting to them but it sounds like it was recorded in the hallway at the Beatle Fest uh, when they were having like a <laughs> sing-along and and that's the other thing to bring up on these records when I mentioned before about my mother trying to play the songs and she couldn't yep these records were rushed out there so fast that I'm sure most of these musicians, and I'm sure some of the musicians playing on this stuff were either reputable. Uh, there is a thought on one of the albums that Rick Derringer plays on it, but that can't be uh, found for sure. That You know, there's a Beach Boys cover record that Lou Reed is on mm -hmm. and he sings, so you could prove it's him. <laughs> but uh, my mom in playing could not get the right beat she couldn't get the right time she just didn't understand how the beatles music would go <laughs> and when you play these records you can see that they have no clue so that's another plus for our our four boys in that their their music they they had a thing it, the the beat, the B-E-A-T in Beatles was perfect. It, was, it wasn't it was beatnik, but it, it turned out to be cool. It was an alternative. And they had something where these records sure did not. Uh, 
You sure don't have it when you call yourself the Bear Cut uh, singing uh, Beatle, the swing in Beatle Mania. And it says also it was recorded in England. It's got our Beatles as bugs on the on the bottom there. Uh -huh. And this too, same thing like one of the others. It has a song, Your Barber is a Beatle too. And Bear Cut Haircut. And Monkey Down to London Town. <laughs> Liverpool Stomp. The Liverpool Stomp. One of the crazy examples, which I can see how uh, it had to be a father who would pick this up, but why? The yes. <laughs> Beatle Buddies. It's the same music as on the Manchester albums from our buddies and diplomat, but it's four women singing. And I doubt the singers were these women. I think this cover was made as a joke that these were possibly some of the executives housewives and they just decided to put this picture on the cover. But then why, if you're trying to sell this, <laughs> what, what, what are you doing with it? Uh, they do. She loves you as he loves you. Uh, they do. Mm. My Bonnie is my buddy. Uh, and they do a couple of, of songs that were also done by the Manchesters, only now you got the female vocals. Uh -huh. And it also says on the back, we think that their names and sound will last long after the Beatles are gone. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> so did a did a father, did a guy pick this up and say, hey, I'm going to want to listen to this? You know, uh, I, I, I don't know on that one. That's... That must have been to confuse the parents. You know. <laughs> and of course, we had the the chipmunks before. We have also by our buddies, the diplomat, the grasshoppers. But you know, on this cover, they don't say the Beatles, but they show the mop top on the top. It says mm -hmm. the grasshoppers saying the mm, hits. And again, it's using some of the same songs that were on the Manchester's only now you've got the voices sped up. So are these all the same backing tracks for these albums? On um, the Manchester's? Manchester's diplomat stuff. Those were the same backing tracks. Yes. Just different vocalists on each one. And this Something. one on wine <laughs> in a similar fashion, it shows four chipmunks or four squirrels. I think they're chipmunks, but of course they can't say that they're the chipmunks because mm -hmm copyright and they can't say right. beatles copyright but here it says a hard day's night in big print of, of course with other beatles songs and again they're doing some tracks that were also on that liverpool's album that i i showed earlier so again similar fashion a way to put it out again only in a in a different speed since you just mentioned them bob wine coat records they're another record company kind of like diplomat that put out a lot of stuff too is right. there any is there any information you know about that record company? Uh well, Winecoat actually went out of their way uh after the Beatles to put out two records as a, a tribute budget cash in on the monkeys. This is one of them. So uh -huh. it's monkey business, but on Winecoat, they did even worse. They while well, they do I'm a believer in last train to Clarksville, they took other titles and made new songs out of them. Like instead of Saturday's Child, on here is Sunday's Kid. <laughs> instead of Papa Jean's Blues, here's Papa Papa's Blue Jeans. Instead of Mary Mary, here's Sally Sally. So they had an actual band or whatever re record these new songs to try to get it to sound like the Beatles. Right. Which is funny since, as far as I know, there's no albums like that on the Rolling Stones. There's no albums like this on The Who. I'm sure there isn't anything like this on The Bee Gees or The Hollies or something. Mm -hmm. But here you had the, the 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 Beatles and the Monkeys. Of course, pre-Beatles, pre of course, was the Kingston Trio, and here's the Princeton Trio. So, <laughs> you know, it's not like it was some some brand new idea that, that never happened before. Right. Uh, Here's one I know nothing about. If anybody out there knows what this record is, please let me know. It's a group called Gene and the Notes. And 
the back cover is the same as the front. Mm. Okay. And the whole thing is Beatles song. The thing on it says, I want to hold your hand on the top. But who officially put this out? Who uh, allowed to put this out is beyond me, but that's that's one of the anomalies of, of that year. Mm -hmm. And how many copies? I, I've rarely seen this. You have a, a, another company, Palace, that, that put out uh, Beatlemania by the schoolboys, which, of course, the back cover calls them the Liverpool Mop Tops. And on the record, it does say the Mop Tops, but it says these four young men. Uh, <laughs> can you add how many you see here? <laughs> Don't even know how to add. They they reissued it with a different cover, again saying these four young men. Huh? So then Palace goes one further and puts out this the by the Liverpool kids called the Beetle Mash with the spelling of two T's on the Beetle, like the one was it the one VJ single that mixed up the with the two T's? Hmm. But not sure. Here's, yeah. Which are probably sort of like the Beetle Buddies. This might be four or a three. Three. I'm I'm not adding either. This is three probably executives wearing really bad Beetle wigs or something, and they threw them on the cover. And again, this has a similar back, like those other two, and right. it mentions the mop tops and it says, you know, four. Well, they couldn't count the four, but they had five or three. But, you know, if you really want to guess, you could talk about yourself as the you-know-who group. <laughs> you had the who, you had the guess who, but here's the you-know-who group. Uh -huh. and it talks about how it has that great new English sound. They don't sound that way. Uh, but I sure hope so, that they didn't think this was the, the Beatles on here. But uh, are, are there Beatles songs on there? Is it all just... No, no, that's just it. There's no Beatles songs on here. And it sounds like it's it's earlier hmm. than than the Beatles, and then you have stuff that just to try to get something out there with the title, but not meaning anything. Uh, Golden Records, which put out a lot of um, kids' records, put out this hmm. Beatle beat, Mother Goose. So now all the characters on this cover is Humpty Dumpty with the Beetle wig, but. The, the record, the recordings itself had to be done way before the Beatles came into existence. It has nothing to do with the Beatles. Absolutely nothing. But here was a way to get something else out there with, with that title. Same goes so the for... the songs don't resemble the Beatles style at all? No, no. In fact, uh, it's Mashed Potato, Holly Gully, The Frog, The Bo Diddley, The Slop, The Ska. Huh. And the Bobby Bossa, Bossa Nova. It turns out, oh, the music was by Milton DeLug. Recognize that name? No. The Gong Show. Oh. And, okay. and Milton DeLug in a band with a thug. That was. Uh... <laughs> wow. <laughs> and I think this is one of my last ones in here. We have the Beatle Beat. And it's teens uh, sort of hidden by this big uh, beetle wig. But on the back, it shows you extensively learning how to do the twist. This is way beforehand. Yeah. But uh, there's another example of anything you possibly can stick, stick the name on. Right. Now there's also, you have George Martin recording instrumental versions of Beatles songs. Yes, yeah, so at least George, at least you have George a name Martin, there. Yeah. George Martin, I can sort of apologize for because obviously he got big by working with them, and he yeah. was an orchestra leader. So it only makes sense that he would do this. However, the album cover, and it's also by United Artists, that figures. Uh, their autographs are on the back. They supposedly wrote this little poem for him. 
and there's a, a picture of them with him sitting in, in front. So, you know, what are you going to think but hope that, you know, when you put it on, they were going to sing along with him on it? Mm. Well, I'm kind of happy that those albums came out anyway for George Martin to make some extra money. Right, you right. Know? You had At all least... the DJs putting out stuff too. Thinking yeah. of DJs, the Ed Rudy album. This one you see everywhere. Yeah. I've seen so many copies of this. Mm -hmm. More copies of this than Whipped Cream and Other Delights by uh, Herb <laughs> Is that supposed to be the number one album that you find in uh, you know that, budget that racks sold? or used records? Yeah, Whip in cream? fact, here's here's a, a a fake album that has the Whipped Cream listed on the top. It has Zorba the Greek and Java. All of those were like big big instrumental things with adults at the time. Right. Again, from our buddies at Wine Coat. <laughs> <laughs> so do you have any history behind wine coat do you know where they started and i believe it at some point they ended up working with like they were a smaller label for rca mm -hmm. so obviously if they were attached to rca they had a a, a big connection right but but this stuff went on you know way beyond 64 it's just 64 i just felt that as you just saw i went through so many album covers how did you keep track and then if if parents were buying things you know I, i'm lucky when uh yellow submarine came out that i got the actual real thing and i didn't get this which actually this isn't uh, too bad a record what is that exactly i think it's a cute cover uh it's uh music from the beatles film yellow submarine and other beetle hits so it does have stuff that appeared in the movie but they're also doing a hard day's night can't buy me love and day trip around here so it, it, and it who's the artist behind that beatles i don't think it says <laughs> hmm. no but it says uh not before many narrow escapes in the sea of holes and the time machine have not before a great many Beatle hits had been performed. So <laughs> they obviously knew about the, the record. There's and one people uh... knew these kind of records were all coming out at, at, at different points. Uh, Bangladesh was such a popular thing. You had to have a fake record on, on just Bangladesh. But it does say here by it's, it's by the tribe. On Pickwick hmm. Records, our our label from right here on Long Island. <laughs> sure, you have listed um, an album called "That's a Beetle World" by Al Fisher and Lou Marks. That's what because you were talking oh. about Swan before. This yes, a... yes, that's on Swan. There's also a jazz LP. It says John Paul and all that jazz. Um, I don't have those out with me at the moment, but it's a Beetle World. It has these horrendous uh comedy skits just making fun of either the hair or uh or something about the screaming at the concert you know oh what say chap are we sitting here at the beetle concert oh yes get 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 your uh earplugs in put the cotton in so it's gonna be loud uh, another well, one by the tribe here you go they even cover yoko's why is redone on this album <laughs> okay you know you gain respectability when the tribe have covered your song. That's it. That's it. But in the in the 70s, there were a lot of records. I got taken in the 70s. I ordered this on TV, Autumn 73. Uh -huh. And it, it says by the sound effects, the little clips they played on the on the TV ad didn't sound bad. But when you hear the full album, you're just like, Ugh. <laughs> Well, I used to buy all the... Uh... Well, the, the real artists, the the Ronco stuff and the K-Tel stuff. K-Tels, yeah. Yeah, but they were all short versions of They songs. were all cut up like crazy, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but you got so many songs that way. I know. I got used to hearing some of the songs that way that later when you heard the full version, you're like, that's not right. <laughs> <laughs> but I think even, even now you have, although they do say they're not the real artists, but kids get those CDs called Kids Bop. Uh-huh. Those aren't the real artists either. Those are, are specially designed cover versions. Some of those would even be played on the Disney Channel when they had a radio station. Because if a song 
had some questionable lyrics. Of course, the kids' Bob version wouldn't have them. So you know, it was it was different like that. So I, you, I, you also there's have always cases... going to be something to get hawked that way. But now in this day and age with MP3s and and ordering stuff online, I don't know if there's that much a a call for that stuff. Mm. Although all our friends here that I I've shown uh, in Japan, um, old days, put out a three disc set. Of CDs of the the uh, a couple of the these said copy albums, and they did. Boy, you would think for this, why go to all this trouble? But they did. Here's actual covers mm. of uh, our friends, the Bugs, our friends, the Schoolboys, all four of them. Our friends, the Man. Yeah. Chesters. So. Wow. That stuff hasn't died. And like you said, uh, anybody who wants to hear some of this stuff, you know, write down some of the titles of the album covers and stuff and look them up on YouTube. They're, they're all there. Different people have either posted them or the companies have. And uh, like I said, it was just their versions of the songs. They just didn't get it. Whereas, you know, we we grew up with a lot of cover versions of Beatles songs. Um, even something like, uh, well, my, one of my favorites is You Got to Hide Your Love Away by The Silky. Sure. But it doesn't sound like the original. It had its own flavor and its own beat to it, but it was good. <laughs> Whereas uh, uh, some of this stuff, mm -mm, they just didn't cut it. But there they were in, in the bins. You know, you didn't see, and, and if somebody has one, tell me <laughs> but i i don't recall anything on the bay city rollers coming out of the budget bins claiming uh you know it was the rollers or here's the the tartan five or something uh, uh -huh. and, yeah when it comes to cover versions of Beatles songs i tend to like it when the artist has their own style they put their own spin on it they kind of make it their own so you know in my early years i didn't really pay much attention to Beatles covers these days i definitely do because it just makes you realize how great that catalog is, that it could lend itself to so many different arrangements and interpretations. Look so, at Cheap Trick, right? Cheap Trick has a lot. They did even full albums and stuff. Yeah. But um, so can you give us, in your opinion, are, are any of these albums any good? <laughs> you know, uh, do you think any of them are really decent recordings that um, are worth listening I, to? I said the 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 bugs has right. some decent songs. Um, the the aforementioned Manchester's like crazy. Um, I like the songs in here. I I waited. There's a song called I Waited, which is done on here. It's done on the Grasshoppers record, and it's done on the Beatle Buddies. Hmm. I, look that up. I waited by the Manchester. It's a great song. Hmm. There's no reason why that that couldn't have been put out somehow officially uh, as as a single. Um, I, I'm sure you know of this. Maybe some of your listeners don't. There was a a, a record also put out um, by John, and it just says John and Paul. It's a 45. Hmm. Uh, John and Paul. People say, and the B side is "I'm Waiting." Right. Um, I think it's "I'm Waiting." Anyway. Um, the the that single was put out bootleggers were copying it onto albums thinking that it was you know a john and paul nerk twin sort of thing it isn't uh but it's not a bad song but did people buy it because it said it was by john and paul of course you, you know but uh there, there's a couple of good songs on that there's a couple of good songs on on the bugs um uh, most of the others oh that this is unusual um there's several different album covers of this, also by our buddies Pickwick in, in Freeport, Long Island. This one says the Mersey Beats. Another cover says the Beats. They kept changing the cover, and they have different pictures of a full band playing. Uh, there's a couple songs on here that are okay. Unusual, though, this same material came out in England. This is a, a British album, and it's a band is called Billy Pepper and the pepper pots dare i tell you how many people now use this band name for 
different things about a certain hoax. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Pepper, Sergeant Pepper, right. using the name Billy. This is way before Sergeant Pepper or Billy Shears came out. And there it is on, on this on this album. Interesting. Huh. Well, um, oh, it's fun to look up these different things. I, I think, you know, I study popular culture. I, I like to find different things that were esoteric, something outside of the usual uh, crux of the thing. Um you know, I I study various religions and things too. So I study books that are on the outside, not just the stuff on the inside too. I, sure. I I like to be into that kind of thing. Comic books. I have a big comic book collection, but I like some of the stuff that's outside the region of the the your basic Marvel and DC. I like to find what other stuff was out there. That's why I have something like this because it was weird to find some oddball memorabilia that really had nothing to do with the band at all. Okay. Well, if you check our description box, uh, Bob has been nice enough to provide a lot of links for certain songs that he thinks we should pay some attention to. And um, I think, didn't you say that some of these are really awful covers? <laughs> oh, yeah, there, there, there's one. Was it part of the, the Beatles, the Liverpool Kids? Uh I think I, I sent you a link of a song. Why don't you let me go? Was the title of the song, uh -huh. and uh, it's uh, it's basically. I mean, the music is exactly the same as "I Want to Hold Your Hand." They just changed the words. So there's the most blatant idea of a, of a cover I, I could I could think of. Yeah, and some <laughs> fans love to hear this stuff. So that's part of why we're doing this show, and. Uh, Good. It's great research that you did on this, Bob. I, I wish I could find out, and that's another project to try to find even more of a discovery as to what went on with these things. But of course, as a either they were fly by night or they quickly rushed this out to make a buck. Um, how do you find out all the info of who actually played on this stuff if they don't really want anybody to know and come after them? You know. Yeah. Um, but. Even the, the regular albums, just the fact that this was such a huge album, I, my personal opinion, it sold way more than anywhere we ever see a listing. I mean, Capital went so far as, let's say, you know, there's a, a garage here in Levittown that has a, a record pressing plant. They brought 500 copies of the jacket, 1,000 copies of the labels and said, quick, here, put this out as fast as you can. And uh, let's get it out there to the stores. So you don't you don't know what you got. The um, I don't have the I just have the cover right here. But this copy had the album where it didn't even have ASCAP or VMI listed yet. So huh. it was all it was all rushed. It was a brand new thing. Uh, people didn't know how long it was going to last. That's why Hard Day's Night came out in black and white because they thought by the time that came out in the theaters, it probably would. Uh, would die and well they didn't spend that much on it i love it in black and white please don't colorize that <laughs> <laughs> well united artists the reason why they they signed what they wanted to do a hard day's night was, was because they had a soundtrack album that they could put out you know there was money to be made with that right that was a right. big reason why they agreed to do the film in the first place so yeah that's a that's an important part of the Beatles history and music history to accept is that, you know, rock and roll was still in its infancy at this time. And nobody could see that any artist would have any kind of longevity, that their records would continue to sell, that their old records would continue to sell 10, 20, 30, 50 years into the future. Nobody thought that way back then. Even the Beatles didn't think that way back then. You and know? I think they also brought, even though there was a, a generation gap, I think they brought adults and, and kids together I mean, uh, I know my my mom liked some of the instrumentals on on the Hard Day's Night. Mm -hmm. uh, my parents used to play the B side of Yellow Submarine. <laughs> so so there you go. You know, got uh -huh. them to play a record where maybe before they w wouldn't have given it a, a moment's notice. Well, the Beatles were in many ways mass appeal in the sense that they did so many genres of music to appeal to a wide range of people like i always like to bring up yesterday 
you know, once that record came out, a lot of older people, maybe your parents at the time said, you know, this band isn't all that bad. You know, it's a pretty good song right there. And even if you go back to, and I just brought this up in one of my podcast shows, I think it was really clever. The first appearance on the Ed Sullivan show for them to do Till There Was You, to do a song from a musical. It was, you know, yes. You know, I mean, there must have been some thought put behind that to make them more a mass appeal, that they weren't just going to be rock and roll. Let's throw in this ballad from the music man here. You right. know, and maybe some older people might say, hey, they're doing till there was you. That's pretty cool. You know, I think there was more thought put behind stuff like that. My father had um, by then already had a bunch of Buck Owens albums. Couldn't believe it when all of a sudden Act Naturally came on. He's like, I know this. Uh-huh. <laughs> it's important in, in any and, uh... musical period. You know, that there was this time when it became really fashionable to do standards, as, um, you know, Linda Ronstadt had her success with it, Rod Stewart, and Paul had Kisses on the Bottom, and you have the the Michael Bublé's of the world doing that kind of stuff. Ringo was doing Sentimental Journey in 1970, you know? And right, right. I know uh, I've only told this story once or twice, but um, my wife's parents were... Well, the father was kind of a snob when it came to rock and roll. And oh. my wife brought home Sentimental Journey and played it. And her father yeah. listened and, and he said, now you hear that? That's good music. <laughs> wow. Because I'm blue, turning gray over mm -hmm. you. Yeah. I know the album. <laughs> <laughs> I just lost myself Lost myself there, there child. child. <laughs> All right, so for all of you, if you're curious, check out the description box. There's all kinds of information in there, songs to check out. Um, if you want to get in contact with Bob, if you want to get in contact with RetroFan, where did I put it? <laughs> I had it here. Oh, here it is, RetroFan Magazine. Oh, you got it right there. <laughs> and uh, Bob, this has been a blast. Have Thank you, you on the channel. I, I enjoyed it too. Hope it wasn't too busy with too much stuff, but it's uh, it was just a way to show everybody that there's so much stuff out there. But, uh, you might have new generations of fans trying to hunt down this stuff now. <laughs> well, now Who they knows? have uh, with Taylor Swift reissuing all her albums and her new versions and this and that. There's a lot of stuff to buy on her stuff too. So mm. she's she's going in that similar category, but I don't see. A record coming out like say Ann Taylor does the best of Taylor Swift or uh, I'm a Swifty or something. You don't you don't have <laughs> stuff like that coming around, but uh, different times. True. Yep, Bob, this has been tremendous. Thanks for being here. Welcome. And welcome. Thanks to all of Bye you everyone. for watching. And we'll see uh, you again. yep, we'll see you next time, folks. Take care. <laughs>